You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Welcome to another episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul. My name is Rob. Thank you very much for hanging out with us today. It is a pleasure to be hanging out with you. We appreciate you taking a few minutes of your day. Let's do it. Let's do it. No, it's going to be a great one. Before we get into today's question, which is about LiDAR and the NDAA, it is a bright time in the drone industry. If you have been worrying about a DJI ban and whatnot, well, be aware of the Insta360 anti-gravity series of drones. Two new drones coming out. It's going to be on the new show. If you don't watch the new show, check it out. Drone News Now on the Drone U HQ network, um, a.k.a. YouTube. Um, that being said, it's actually really exciting. I feel like we are finally getting serious camera manufacturers to take on serious problems and solve them. And here we go. It is funny, though, Rob, because Insta360, DJI tried copying Insta360 with a new 360 camera that was supposed to come out, I think, this month. And Insta360 says, hold my beer. <laughs> it's just, a, no, it's a good example that, you know, China imitates. Like they made the great first drones, but now they're just imitating things to try to regain market share. Whereas Insta360 is innovating. So you can either imitate and uh, make money quickly and then die or innovate. So it's going to be really interesting to see exactly uh, what happens. But that being said, Today's question is about LiDAR. Um, it's about flying LiDAR. Very interesting information out of the 2024 NDAA that will impact a lot of people using and flying LiDAR. Um, I know a lot of contractors love the HESI LiDAR core that's used in a lot of drone systems. That has been specifically named as a system that cannot be used for certain government contracts. So we're going to be talking about that. But before we get to that, we're going to be talking about our mapping and modeling class. We've got a couple of classes coming up. We just finished a couple. Started with flight mastery, getting those systems of operation so that you can gain confidence in understanding how to avoid emergencies, but also how to fly smooth and crispy. That way you have the confidence and competence to fly in any environment and be able to get the job done. But on top of that, we move into our mapping class, which is really focused uh, still on PIX4D, PIX4D Mapper, React, Matic, uh, also focusing on Esri's site scan because you're gonna learn just why certain cloud software is amazing and why certain desktop software is even better. It really depends on uh, the goal of your program or the goal of your company but at least you get to have hands-on experience with both, check them both out, and be able to really discern exactly what's right for you. That's the drone you difference, is we're agnostic to different manufacturers, softwares. That way you get exactly what you need to make the right decisions. In fact, Rob, we had a surveyor in our class this last week, and he got to learn the systems of Pix4D Mapper, so now he understands the systems of acquisition as we flew four real-world missions, geo-reference them, but then he finally realized that it was much cheaper to use Trimble Business Center to do his processing and then do his planimetrics and line work in Civil 3D. So he's going from TBC to Civil 3D instead of Pix4D to Civil 3D just because it's much cheaper. So in the age of the drone manufacturing being shaken up, the software is being shaken up too. It goes to show you can't just charge everyone and expect them to be loyal. You've got to provide value. What's the engine behind TBC? I don't know. I don't know. There's so many new engines out there. Really? And a lot of new software is using Web ODM as an engine, which I thought was really fascinating. No kidding. Uh -huh. So it must be good enough. Because that's open source, right? Yep. Yeah. Hmm. So check out the classes. What a world we live in. Yes, it is. Check out the classes, thedroneu.com, and click on in-person classes or events and sign up because our classes are cheaper than the competitors, as many students just told me. And a lot of students told me that they got way more value out of what they learned in flight mastery and mapping. Look, it's not just, you know, basic exercises that people copy. There's a reason we've never put our exercises out on YouTube. We don't want to be copied. And long story short is we're still the best. So if you want to experience the best flight school for drones, then you need to come to an in-person training. All right, let's play that funky question. Paul and Rob. Just a question. Does LiDAR units have to be 
NDAA approved? And is there only one or are there several that we can use as we move forward for government contracts? Hey, Jimmy, thank you for the question. It's an important question because things are changing fast and furious with respect to this particular issue. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people have, I mean, obviously everybody talks about the drones and what's happening with those. I know everybody's sick of talking about DJI and banning and there's people that are pissed and they get pissed at us and blah, blah, blah. Even though we're just trying to tell the truth and be objective, but not a lot of people have talked about the sensor side of it. No, they haven't. But okay, before we get into the sensor side of it, something hit me today that I want to put in the new show. I want to run by you. So everyone's like sick <laughs> while recording a show. Yeah, yeah. Everyone is <laughs> is sick and tired of like, is DJI going to be banned? What if they don't end up banning DJI yeah. and they just created all this stir to drum up domestic manufacturing and competitors to DJI? If that was their original intent, number one, I don't believe it is. I don't think they're that smart. Number two, it failed. <laughs> Because <laughs> people are just pissed. <laughs> I guess only time will tell, but this whole uh, Chinese ban, um, Section 232 investigation against China started last week. So we officially have three weeks before the U.S. government makes a designation on whether DJI is banned or not. It's finally culminating. And this is per the executive order, right? This is, what yes. we're referring to specifically? Yep. Yeah, But we are here to talk about LiDAR because we've been having a lot of clients reaching out to us to purchase a FreeFly Astro Max. They've been asking about LiDAR. So we had to go down the rabbit hole just to better understand, do you really need an NDAA approved LiDAR system? Because a lot of the NDAA stuff has been for drones. There is you know, um, what is it called? There is a drone model list of approved NDAA drones. There is also a component list now. And one of those things that we need to be talking about is LIDAR. So from the 2024 NDAA, under section 164, effective in 2026, the Department of Defense is prohibited from operating, procuring, or using certain LIDAR technology that is manufactured, developed, or reliant on software, network connectivity, or data storage associated with China, Russia, Iran, or North Korea. DOD's use of any system that incorporates or interfaces with such LIDAR technology is also prohibited. Now, here's the interesting part, because most of the LIDAR sensors that are out there, Rob, are the HESI XT32 core. Listen to this. Section 164 expressly prohibits LiDAR developed by HESI Technology, headquartered in Shanghai, China, a leading manufacturer of LiDAR sensors that are used in both commercial self-driving cars and Chinese autonomous warfighting systems. The Secretary of Defense can provide a waiver to certain institutions, but it requires the Secretary to certify to Congress that the waiver is needed for the national interests of the United States, a.k.a. you ain't getting a waiver. I cannot even imagine (laughs) what it would entail to get one of those waivers. I don't want to even speculate. I just wouldn't want to sit there and have to listen to Pocahontas ask me questions about LIDAR. (laughs) (laughs) I don't even want to hear questions about banking, (laughs) which is supposedly her specialty. Oh, wow. Oh, God. Gosh, she needs to go back to school. Uh, anyway. She, no, she just needs to go. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Anyways, okay. Term limits we agree on. Okay, well, uh, yes. um, now here's the thing. Federal contracting. Can you use HESI technology with federal contracting? Well, any federal contracting that is in or around or provided by the Department of Defense, which is actually a long list, to be honest, mm-hmm. you cannot use a HESI base LIDAR system. So that being said, I guess the question is, do you need an NDAA LIDAR system that's compliant with the NDAA? First of all, it's only going to be in effect June 30th of 2026. So if you're doing federal contracting that does not have an impact on the Department of Defense, well, then the answer is yes. But it's my understanding that a lot of critical infrastructure is protected slash regulated by the Department of Defense. So this is where it kind of gets like gray, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the contracts that many drone pilots are getting that are paying the really high dollar amounts to justify these expensive LiDAR sensors are provided by the government. If anything is associated, affiliated, connected to directly or indirectly to the Department of Defense, you cannot use the HESI sensor. 
So I guess the begs the question of if you know what LIDAR work you're going to be doing and it does not is not affiliated with DOD whatsoever, then you're probably in the clear. But what happens if you spend the how much was that sensor that you because Jimmy got it's a like quote, 55 grand, 55 grand. Could you imagine spending 55 grand and you can't get the most lucrative contracts? Yeah, for sure. And I think and I don't I don't know this really well in terms of the government contracting infrastructure and system, but there's overlap in terms of if you're doing something, let's just say for the Department of Interior, I believe that some of those purchasing databases would it would give you connection to other departments within the federal government and so you're lo- you could potentially lose out on some of that overlap that would that could potentially come your way if they see you're doing x for say the department of interior as i said and the department of defense says hey they know how to do this and i don't know if this is exactly how it happens but i know there's overlap then they'd have to say what are you using at some point and it wouldn't work So I was curious about how, what is the total percentage of contracts that are affiliated with the Department of Defense? Well, their budget is, well, it's now a trillion dollars for 26. So it's the biggest budget by far. It's 70% of all federal contracts. That's fascinating. That's a ton. That completely changes, like, (laughs) that completely changes. To use a technical term. Yes. Um... Kind of like the the calculation here of should you spend fifty five grand and you can only bid on thirty percent of what's out there? I mean, that's almost like well, that for federal. Obviously, there's other work that you could do, but like you said, probably most of the high dollar contracts are going to be government related. Yeah, and even if it's like say the Department of Transportation from whatever Wyoming, YDOT, they might have money coming in from the feds, and then that connects you to that, right? which Uh I think, I don't know. See, there's some of these questions that, frankly, I do not have a 100% answer. So, deep research says over 60% of federal contract dollars are directly awarded by the Department of Defense, and many more are indirectly connected through supporting agencies, projects, or dual-use tech. Wow. And by the way, we've called that HASAI, but it does say technology that is manufactured, developed, relying on software, network, connectivity, data storage, associated with China, blah, China, Russia, Iran. So, it's... Then they specifically call out that particular LIDAR for whatever reason. There's others that you got to be careful of. I have an idea. Uh Uh-oh. I'm going to buy HESI sensors and paint them green. Oh. (laughs) Paul, never one to shy away from drama. (laughs) No. (laughs) Look, that report came out. It's uh, it's pretty clear. But I I just am making, I'm just poking the bear. Look, look, we all want, we all want these solutions that we've gotten used to. Okay. We got to be all laugh about it. That's all. That being said, you know, when it comes to these LiDAR solutions, do you ever see LiDAR being manufactured in the United States? I don't know. Do you ever see ibuprofen being manufactured in the United States? L- Louisiana. Really? There's, uh-huh. We yeah. actually trained a guy two years ago, and he is doing mapping work for new pharmaceutical um, manufacturing plants that are utilizing water in Louisiana. So I think actually the answer to that question is un- undoubtedly yes. Well, then yes to LIDAR as well. Uh, we need autonomy. If we can do ibuprofen, we can do LIDAR. <laughs> on that no, bombshell. What about, what about batteries and some of those things? I mean, that's a really good question as well. But it also doesn't have to be manufactured here. I mean, that could be, I don't know, a Swiss company or somewhere else, right? And then we'd be fine. Well, and like, look at people like Samsung um, that do battery manufacturing. Panasonic is huge mm-hmm. in battery manu- manufacturing. Like Japan, the Korea, uh, uh-huh. South Korea, some yeah. of those folks. Yeah. So, well, and it's also going to be really interesting to see what other type of national security dollars are going to go into manufacturing as a whole. True. It's pretty clear with what Trump just did that it's going to be tens, if not hundreds of billions going into UAS manufacturing, Mm -hmm. battery manufacturing, all sorts of tech manufacturing. So what do you think the Delta is? And I don't know if you'd know this, but between say one of these LIDAR sensors from Hasai or one that's manufactured in the United States or a friend of the United States. I think it's probably at least like, what, 30, 40% more? I was just going to say 40% more. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Which honestly isn't terrible because they do almost about the same thing. Now, from what I have heard, because uh, I do not have direct um, use with the LiDAR system 
that we quoted Jimmy on, but supposedly a lot of the HESI sensors are very similar to DJI in that they're very easy to use. They're very convenient. They're not um, super complicated, et cetera. But I'm also kind of like, well, if you're making 15 grand a day, should it be easy? Cause then everyone could do it and then just drives the price down. Like there's so many, there's so many economic mm. variables that I feel like we always tend to answer on the emotional side of like, yes, I want DJI, you know, like, or yes, I want HESI. But well, what's it's really the, the, what are all the other factors just so that we can make the right decision, you know? Yeah, that's true. But I mean, just in terms of the best tool for the job at the best cost, that's what I want. Yeah. A hundred percent. The cheapest and the easiest to get the same job done, if not better. Why would I say no to that? That'd be goofy. Valid. Valid. Well, on that bombshell, if you are looking for an Astro drone because you want an American drone that can shoot video, photos, mapping, inspections, and fly LIDAR, give us a ring or shoot us an email. Paul at the drone you.com. Rob at the drone you.com. And uh, yeah, send your questions into askdroneu.com. It's really interesting. I feel like we are on the precipice of like we've been on the low with this whole banning DJI, banning HESI, all these things. Mm -hmm. And the competitors are now coming into the market. And I feel like we're on the uphill trajectory now of like coming back. So as like, an industry, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I hope you're right. I, I mean, mean the, I think the future is bright. And and look, I want everyone to succeed and no matter who you are or whatever. Like, you know, you know, regarding Anzu and everything, I, I've had long conversations with with Randall. And, you know, look, they're trying to bring a solution to the market that works. You know, whether or not it actually meets um certain security standards or regulatory standards is outside the purview of what I'm trying to say right now. Just saying mm -hmm. that like, look, there, there's a problem. They're trying to provide a solution. That's kind of the American way. Um, it's not the American way though, that to, um, I'll just leave it there. There's, there's issues. So <laughs> I was, <will say, laughs> that's a good idea. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, what I, was it? 16, 1260 H the current list came out in January of 2025. Unless they're under here on a code word or something. I don't see them on here. But I might just be Look, missing. Look, Autel's on there. That's interesting. Yeah, Autel's right there. Obviously, DJI is. And then about 74 others. But I don't think I see Anzu. Um, unless they have some other name for their entity. So, hey. Interesting. I don't know. Interesting. I, don't know. I think we are going to see some news come out here soon with the whole tariff thing with China and how it's going to impact some of these bans. Apparently, as we record, they just finished negotiations. So, we'll see. Oh. Yeah. Pow, pow. Well, we're going to find out. Thank you for joining us. As always, if you have a question, ask DroneU.com. Look, if you want the best training taught from experience, there's nowhere else other than DroneU. My name is Paul. I'm Rob. This is DroneU HQ. Hey.